wants to dominate the world. At least that's what Kerry Gershanik says. He's the author of Political Warfare, Strategies for Combating China's Plan to Win Without Fighting. He just finished a Taiwan Fellowship at National Sun University. And Kerry, it's great to be able to speak with you. And I want to ask you about what just happened in Taiwan this past weekend. China sent 23 military planes near Taiwan. What message is China giving Taiwan at this time with those planes? First, Natalie, thank you for having me on RTI. And second, there's a number of messages here. Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are sending political warfare messages to at least three audiences. And they're also doing uh, what any prudent commander would do, and that's make sure that their, their forces, the People's Liberation Army, is, uh, is preparing to conduct combat operations successfully if she sends them in to attack Taiwan. So first, let's break down the three audiences, minimum of three audiences. The first audience is the new Biden administration. Uh, Joe Biden and his, uh, his team are getting in place now, the national security team. Uh, the PRC has always tested every new American president. And it was totally expected that uh, right away Xi Jinping would test both the resolve and the skill of the Biden administration. So sending those three large flights of uh, both PLA Air Force and PLA Navy aircraft uh, was designed to see what the response would be mm. from the Biden administration. The other was uh, the other audience. The second one is you. It's the people of Taiwan. It's the government of Taiwan. The, the purpose of PRC political warfare as it pertains to Taiwan is to demoralize and divide you, to make you quit, to make you just walk like sheep uh, into the, the cold embrace of the Chinese Communist Party and become a province of the People's Republic of China. You are going to be worn down. They want to demoralize you. They want you to think you cannot win. You cannot maintain your sovereignty. You cannot retain your freedom. And they do this in a number of ways, one of which is military intimidation, one of which is those three very large flights that they send uh, uh, for both combat training and, and for psychological warfare purposes against you. The third audience, it's internal. People's Republic of China. It's the mm -hmm. subjects. I won't call them citizens. You're, you're, you're a citizen in your country. I'm a citizen in mine. We're in democracies. The 1.3 billion people in the People's Republic of China, they're subjects, just like under any other monarchy. So the audience is also, for political warfare purposes, internal. It is to not just intimidate you, but it's to help enhance the stature of Xi Jinping to the people of China and to win him uh, continued support by the military, which has been pushing for the invasion of Taiwan. So again, the audience for the, the hyper-nationalization of the people of China that the Chinese Communist Party has been working on since 1949, um, now it's, in, it's on steroids. And so those flights were applauded um, and they are designed to enhance the morale of the, the, the Chinese subjects while demoralizing you, the, the people of the democratic uh, Taiwan Republic of China. So do you think that we should be afraid though? Because, you know, there's some reports that are saying, is this a rehearsal for war? Forbes magazine has an article that said that. Yes, they are. Ex the, the Xi Jinping and the, the, the CCP are expanding the military intimidation. You have to ask yourself, why are they doing that before I can answer your question? Why are they doing that? Because they saw in the last <clears throat> presidential and national elections in Taiwan, you aren't going to be like sheep. You're not going to just quit and, and allow the PRC to take over Taiwan. You want to defend your sovereignty, your freedom, uh, the rule of law. And so they, they found that their political warfare, which, in which they've, in, they've invested billions and billions of dollars, massive uh, amount of resources, people, effort to get you to quit, you didn't. So now it's the military option that they're playing up. Uh, would they do it? Communists are opportunistic. 
Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is always opportunistic. If the opportunity was there, they very well would do it. But this answers your question. Should you be scared? You should be prudent. And you should begin taking even greater steps than you're taking now. And I applaud the steps that are being taken now by the Tsai administration and the people of Taiwan. But take even greater steps to do two things. One, strengthen yourself internally to fight the political warfare that is being waged against you. It's an existential battle. Understand that. That's how they plan to win, to win without fighting. Go back to the title of my book. They want to win without going to kinetic warfare. It's a struggle for them. It's a massive effort for them, but they want to win without having to send in the shells, send in the missiles, send in the bombers that they were, you know, in the, on the mission last week, anti-submarine aircraft. They want to do it without having to destroy all your technological capacity, all your brain power, the, the, the human capital, as well as the technology on Taiwan. They want you to quit. So strengthen yourself against that attack. Strengthen yourself militarily. Let the uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party, and the PLA know they're not going to win. It's, it's going to be a massive loss for them if they try to invade. You need to improve, continue to improve the weaponry and especially combat training of your military forces. And you need to take a deeper look at what it takes to mobilize the civilian force like the Baltic nations have done, like Switzerland has done, so that everybody, everyone with a stake every in Taiwan, in the freedom and democracy, in the future of Taiwan, you're looking at how do we defend the homeland. It's not just the military's job. We're all citizens of democratic Taiwan. How do we all work together to protect our country? And again, there's some good role models worldwide. How do you think Taiwan is doing in terms of understanding, you know, what you call political warfare, which is not just military, you know, warfare, and protecting itself against it? Oh, Natalie, it's not Kerry Gershanik calling it political warfare. I'm using the PRC's terminology. Political warfare is their terminology. Americans have used it. Taiwan used it. Every country uses political warfare to an extent, but it's the nature of the regime that we need to worry about. This is a, an expansionist, militarily powerful, repressive, brutally repressive, totalitarian fascist nation. It's on the march. And it's using political warfare in ways that no other nation has ever dreamed of doing. It has the capacity to do it, and it has the will to do it. I read through your book and I found a very interesting and a bit scary, you know, to hear all the different tactics that China is using. They're, you know, permeating universities, uh, the internet, you know, social media. Can you tell the average citizen in Taiwan or, you know, around the world, what kind of tactics that China is using to influence people's thinking and uh, to try to dominate um, the world in, in different ways? Natalie, political warfare encompasses just about everything short of mid-intensity conflict. That is, armies going to war on a battlefield on a major scale, okay? So that includes proxy armies. The, the PRC has a proxy army in Myanmar, for example, called the United Wa State Army, WSA. It occupies a country on the border uh, inside Myanmar. Uh, it occupies a territory the size of Belgium. The uniforms, the helicopters, the tanks, the anti-air missiles, all the, all the equipment that it has, where do they come from? It came from the PLA. Um, so proxy armies and, uh, and wars of revolution that, that many people thought had stopped in the late 1960s, 1970s. Uh, no, those, those wars, those proxy wars go on funded by and uh, supported by the, the People's Republic of China. Assassination, disappearances. If you're a, a bookseller from Hong Kong and you think you're safe in Thailand, you're not. You will get disappeared. You will be, uh, you'll be kidnapped. Uh, that's all political warfare. Um, violence, you've had gangs uh, in Thailand, uh, Taiwan, uh, just like other countries, gangs that are bought and paid for by United Front organizations that are uh, working close uh, closely with the United Front Work Department uh, run by the Politburo. 
So those criminal gangs are locals. They're your citizens, but they're roughing up your people. They're committing acts of vandalism. They, uh, in some countries, it's murder, um, intimidation. Um, these are some of the tactics of political warfare. Media warfare, which is big in Taiwan, and that uh, you have stood up to, to your great credit. Uh, but you, not just the PRC's official organs like Xinhua and People's Daily coming in and attacking you. No, they, they take over your media, just like in America. They either co-opt the news media or they buy it outright. But basically, that news media, American, the Taiwan media, is spouting the Chinese Communist Party line. So these are all strategies within the overall warfare, of political warfare. And the People's Republic of China calls it political warfare. So we should. Terminology is absolutely essential here. If you don't know what's happening to you, if you can't recognize it, if you cannot define it, there's no way you can fight it. You're going to lose. So they call it warfare. They're at war with us. Can I give you an example of, of how the, the inability to understand uh, on the American side uh, uh, that terminology of war led to massive casualties of Americans? Sure, sure. Uh, late 1990s. It's a fellow running around Southwest Asia. He's wearing a towel on his head. And he's saying, I hate you, America. I'm going to kill you. I'm, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to kill Americans everywhere I can. And uh, our elites, our intelligence community, our political leaders, they're all saying, yeah, yeah, you live in a cave. You have a towel on your head. You know, run along, little boy. You're not a problem. So on September 11, 2001, we had thousands of Americans die fairly hideous deaths as planes hijacked aircraft, American aircraft, slammed into the World Trade Center slammed into the Capitol building, slammed into the fields of Pennsylvania, because we wouldn't take it on face value when Osama bin Laden says, I'm at war with you, America. We would not accept it. You're, you're insignificant. You don't matter. You can be at war with us, but we don't care. You start caring when you start losing about 3,000 Americans. Um, and so let's take the PRC at its word. You say you're at war with us? Fine. We're going to go to war, too but we'll do it on the political warfare battlefield. So what would you make of the comment that Xi Jinping uh, made this week at the World Economic Forum that the strong should not bully the weak? If you look at my book and you read the narratives and the themes of PRC, political warfare and propaganda, um, this is a recurrent theme that, that we're, we're small, uh, we're not a threat to anyone, we're, we're you know, poor little China, don't hurt the feelings of 1.3 billion people by accusing us of being the, the hegemon. Don't accuse us of being expansionists. Don't accuse us simply because we circumnavigate uh, Taiwan and we're constantly threatening you with the amphibious assault exercises and, and words saying that we're going to go to war against you. Don't think that we're militaristic. <laughs> it's, it's Orwellian doublethink. Um, of course, if you go back and read what their wolf warrior diplomats out of Beijing have been saying about we're a big country, you're a small country, go back to those um, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and other meetings where uh, but Beijing has been pretty blunt about we're a strong nation, you're not, you're a vassal state or a tributary state at best, and uh, we're, the, we're the celestial empire, you will kowtow to us. It's political warfare designed mm. to woo and people into complacency and to fool those who aren't paying attention. So how would you um, describe the U.S.'s reaction to what happened this week? How do you think they're doing in terms of responding to China's military threats? We still have to see how the Biden administration shapes up and what they actually do. Um, I've got concerns about it because I know the people there and I, I saw what happened during uh, the Obama-Biden administration. But I think they're off to a strong start. I think that the statements that were made immediately after that and then the, um, uh, the wording 
about the six assurances for those, uh, there's no time for a history lesson here, for those who don't know how important the six assurances are to the comfort, safety, and your ability to sleep at night in Taiwan, they're critically important. Um, this administration, the new administration, picked up where the Trump administration left off and is now speaking of the six assurances, which previously those six assurances that President Reagan had given uh, were, were sort of dropped from the discussion. Um, so there's words that are being said, there are actions that are being taken. The uh, USS Roosevelt carrier battle group that sailed through the South China Sea. Um, we're not seeing a backing off of freedom of navigation operations, and we're not just sending one ship in. That was very significant to me that um, that carrier battle group went in as a carrier battle group. So I think that this is a somewhat chastened older and wiser team that's coming in this time. They're gonna pick up, in my ideal world, they're going to pick up where the Trump administration, the good people like Randy Shriver, um, uh, Sec uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, uh, Matt Pottinger, the great work that they did in support of Taiwan and the great work they did helping America to realize what a threat China is and help us to build the capacity to stand up and, and fight for our freedom. Um, I'm hoping this new administration continues in that vein. They're off to a strong start in my view, Natalie. And if you were in Taiwan, I, I know you were here for a few years, would you be um, afraid of what China is doing? I wouldn't let fear dominate. Um, I, I knew what I was getting into when I took, uh, it's actually almost three years that I was at National Shenzhen University as a fellow. I went over there at that time because uh, Xi Jinping a few years before had given the PLA until 2020 to be able to invade Taiwan. I was there as a U.S. Marine ready to fight to defend Taiwan some years ago, and I was willing to be back there at a time when Xi Jinping had uh, telegraphed that he wanted his forces to be able to attack you. So I wouldn't say I'd be afraid. I would be cautious, and I would do the things that I recommended uh, that you do. And that's one, start strengthening the capacity you're already building to fight PRC political warfare. And two, go even further with technology, equipment, realistic combat training, and then developing a civilian capacity to help resist. And make sure Xi Jinping and the Politburo know it's going to be hell to pay. You will not win if you attack Taiwan. You will not successfully invade us. So can you tell us how China is working on social media and the internet? Because all of us are on the internet. What should we be aware of? China has mastered social media warfare. Um, and to Taiwan's great credit, you now have a major effort underway to, to regain the, the, what you call the cognitive domain. Through social media warfare, the PRC and its, its uh, tr online trolls and its uh, strategic support force, which has at least 200,000, uh, maybe 300,000 people working on attacking you through the internet, through cyber means, um, you in Taiwan have stood up a major effort under President Tsai's direction um, to to regain the cognitive domain and to fight back on that battlefield. You did a pretty good job in the 2020 elections, really well. Uh, you learned the lessons from the 2018 in terms of election interference. And you're now fighting the intimidation that comes, uh, that's used against your people, against your academics, against your politicians, against the destructive fake news that's put out there on, uh, in, in the course of social media warfare. You're, you're taking on the, the, the phony uh, false flag uh, online uh, sources and you're exposing them. Sunshine is a great disinfectant, as you know, being in the media. So the, the more you expose these efforts and, and the United Front organizations in Taiwan that are involved in, some, in the PRC social media warfare against you, the more successful you're gonna be. So social media warfare is a very serious threat and it's, it's being used in America as well. It is, so what do you think the average American or you know, anyone around the world should know about how China is um, you know, working in, in the media? 
Well, again, know that there are about 200 to 300,000 people just in the People's Liberation Army alone dedicated to fooling you, to deceiving you, to making uh, that person seem like I'm your best friend and I agree with you politically, but you should think this way and putting out fake reports. Um, know that that's just on the military side. Then you've got the 50 cent army that's out there in China. The netizens, if you've heard that term, the ones that um, there was a, a major assault against one of the most popular boy bands in the Republic of Korea, South Korea, uh, a couple of months ago in the fall. Why did um, these people come under social media warfare assault? because they sang a tribute to the South Korean and American soldiers who died defending South Korea against the people, or the Red Army, the People's Liberation Army, so-called volunteers, and the North Korean forces that were trying to overtake South Korea. So the netizens, so-called netizens, stirred up a great deal of controversy, attacking not just the band, but their sponsors. That's the terror of social media warfare. You destroy people's lives. You destroy their reputation. You destroy their livelihood. So that's part of the, the, the terror operation that, that the PRC and the PLA wage against people that they don't like around the world. That's what you should know. And that's a beginning. My book will give you a lot more on that. So I noticed that they do that to a lot of Taiwan celebrities who stand up for Taiwan. And you're saying that these are average citizens or netizens in China, and they're getting paid for all of their, uh, their vocal support of you know, the Chinese line. Is that right? They, they get paid so much, Natalie, for every... Uh, they, they put a comment on a magazine article. A few years, uh, I read a lot for publication. And, um, just for fun, a co-author and I... Uh, watched when we wrote an article on how to improve your, the Taiwan's Marine Corps, we, we, as soon as it was posted, we knew when it would be posted, and we watched, and within minutes of it being posted, we had 50 Cent Army and PLA online trolls putting negative comments about the article. But you, you see how that works. Mm -hmm. They're monitoring publications, they're monitoring newspapers, they're monitoring magazines, and they're immediately putting the PRC spin on the commentary that goes on there. So, uh, again, it's pervasive. These aren't ordinary citizens. These are people who know, they get training, they're organized. The 50 Cent Army, just because they're civilian, doesn't mean there's no organization. They're given themes from the propaganda department, and then they go out and they execute using those themes. That's, that's fascinating. No wonder, you know, I see so many patriotic Chinese comments, you know, all over the internet. And so they're actually getting paid to do this. A lot of them are, and again, a lot of them are, are PLA. And uh, again, the book goes into great detail in organizations. We won't do that here. But you have to understand uh, the, the hyper-nationalization issue that I brought up earlier, and I know you do understand this. But when you make your citizenry hyper-nationalistic, then a lot of the other subjects in the People's Republic of China are going to join in on that. So don't, um, don't assume that it's all people who are paid or all PLA uh, soldiers and strategic support force who are doing this. Yeah, there's a lot of Joe and Jane average Chinese who are online and they know they can attack someone overseas, but they would go to jail, they would disappear forever and their families just as likely if they said anything similar against their own government. So it's fun to watch, but it's important to combat. So what do people like us journalists, what should we do when we are on the end of those comments? Like this, maybe this video will get a ton of comments from the PLA cyber force, right? <laughs> I would wear it as a badge of honor. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's one thing you can do. It, it, don't take it seriously. You know where it's coming from. A more and more enlightened populace will also know where it's coming from. So by talking about this uh, today, Natalie, you and I are educating those, those watching and listening. Be skeptical. Be highly skeptical for mm -hmm. anything you see that, that mindlessly, lemming-like uh, regurgitates the party line of a fascist totalitarian, brutally repressive regime that, that has concentration camps and is committing genocide 
who on God's earth is going to write comments in support of that kind of a regime? No one you want to listen to. Mm. Well, Carrie, it's been fascinating speaking with you and uh, thank you for your insights and also thank you for your book. Um, the book that Carrie Gershanik just wrote and published is called Political Warfare Strategies for Combating China's Plan to Win Without Fighting. Thanks again, Carrie, for joining me today. Thank you so very much for having me on tonight, Natalie.